What if I were to tell you that after watching this 10 to 12 minute YouTube video, I'm gonna be able to teach you how to make the perfect thread on a CNC lathe. Hey team, this is Luke, a practical machinist, back for another awesome video of the Lathe Lab. If you believe me, watch. If you don't, watch and see. After we go over those three tips, you're gonna be able to program and run a perfect, beautifully smooth thread on a CNC lathe, just like this. So now the three topics that we're gonna cover in this video, and the reason I'm only doing three, you could break it down and cover about two or three topics here, one or two here, probably 15 different topics, but these three I think will make your thread go from sharp, ugly, and non-functional to absolutely beautiful. When I make a thread, I like to be able to grab that part with the thread, run it in my fingers. I want it to feel like a piece of jewelry, smooth and beautiful. The three that we're gonna cover, first we're gonna go over the tooling selection, then we're gonna go over your programming and your programming method, and then last, but definitely not least, we're gonna cover something very near and dear to my heart, deburring the thread. So when it comes to threading on a lathe, CNC lathe, you have outside threads or inside, external or internal. Several different ways to make these threads. For an internal thread, you could tap it, either a cut tap or a forming tap, or you could do what my preferred method is if the thread size allows it, and do a single point thread. Now, same with the outside. With the outside thread, there's a couple different ways to do that as well. You could use a die head or a die, or you could single point thread it. I mean, I guess you could thread roll, but we're not gonna cover that in this video. But for this specific video, we're gonna be covering single point threading. And when you're single point threading, tooling selection matters huge. Now, we're not gonna talk about tooling from a budgetary standpoint, we're gonna talk about tooling from a, what's the better tool to use? So there's a tool like this. This is a Groover style threading tool. It works, you can do single point threading with it, but it's not optimal. It is a part, what's called a partial profiling or a non-topping insert. What I like to use is something more like this. It's a lay down three edge full profile threading insert. If you wanna make a thread that's going to be beautiful, when I mean beautiful, like I said in the intro, it's smooth. There's no burrs up at the crest of the thread. You can see a nice radius, it's smooth to the touch, goes in your mating part of your go gauge very freely. I definitely would strongly advise that you contact your tooling manufacturer and ask for a full profile or a topping threading insert. Another thing about the tooling that it might be very obvious to some, but not as obvious to others. The threading insert on a full profile has to match the pitch of the thread you're cutting. And if you go back to other videos on Practical Machinists, you'll see a lot myself and others talk about a thread pitch or your TPI, threads per inch. Say for instance, you have a three quarter 16 thread. 16 is your pitch. 16 threads per inch. You need to have, if you're using a full profiling, which you should, a topping insert, your insert has to match the thread that you're trying to make for it to function properly. The reason is the geometry of the thread itself, meaning the thread root, the angle, and the crest all have a certain proportion, a thread height that changes based on the pitch. So if you were cutting an eight pitch threading insert, or sorry, an eight pitch thread, and you wanted to use a, say an ex for example, a 32 pitch insert, it would never work. You would completely cut off that major diameter, which is the diameter over the thread, because the thread height is different. On a finer pitch thread, the thread height is less. On a coarse pitch thread, the coarser you get, the higher, the, the bigger the thread gets, the larger of a thread height. So that's the second part of the tooling that's super important. That's a technical term, super important. 
full profiling insert, ensure that the insert pitch matches the pitch of the thread you're trying to make. It will be beautiful, trust me. Let's move on to the second section that we're gonna talk about programming method. So when we talk about programming method, we're not just talking about what can cycle to use, we're gonna talk about even our programming method leading up to that thread. In the first section, we talked about full profiling threading inserts. That full profiling or that topping insert is actually going to also finish that major diameter. So the programming method, step number one, I like to turn my major diameter in preparation for that insert. Go to your machinery handbook, contact your manufacturer, contact someone that you know with extensive knowledge on threads to determine what your major diameter has to be. We're gonna go back to the three quarter 16 example. Three quarter 16 external thread, go to the machinery's handbook, find that section of it. It's gonna have a major, uh, your major diameter min max. You wanna shoot for the middle, but you're not gonna to turn to that middle. You're gonna leave a couple thousands per side on that major diameter turn so that way when you thread you can go back and clean up the major at minimum turn it to the higher end of that specified major diameter that's the first step the second step when it comes to program programming method i made a video on g92 and i got a little bit of pushback people saying why use G92 when you could use G76? Absolutely valid criticism or valid suggestion, however way you wanna spin the cat. But what I say is this, program what works for you. If your shop uses a lot of G76 or you yourself does, use a G76. If your shop uses a lot of G92, use a G92. I do not, for, and we're talking normal standard threads, I do not think a G76 will make a better thread than a G92. Sure, there are applications in which it will. If you have to vary your lead-in, and we are gonna do a video on G76 as a complimentary video to the G92 and talk about the pros and cons. From my experience, if you wanna make a thread conform to the standards of your customer print, send a quality part to your customer, they're not gonna know. Is it a G92 or a G76? They're not going to. They both have been used for decades. They both will be continued to use for decades. But use what's best for you. What I would recommend is that you have a spring pass at the very end. What a spring pass is, is on a G76 or a G92, and you can go find videos on a Practical Machinist channel referencing both of them, you write your threading insert to cut down your thread to achieve the certain pitch diameter you want. So you drop down an X, da 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 until you reach that. Add another line for a spring pass. In the G92, you would just add the X, the same last X that you did. It's gonna basically cut air. Well, not air, but it's gonna cut that same path over. I do that on some of them. On harder materials, I might add two spring passes. I find it just kind of trims the fat a little bit, makes it look a little bit more beautiful for you and eventually when you send it out to your customer or your end user. Another thing as far as programming, verify that your RPM is to the manufacturer's standards. Now you're not gonna use G96, you're gonna use G97. You do not wanna vary your surface footage, you wanna maintain your RPM over. What I like to do is wrap it in my position turn on my RPM, give it a second of a dwell, G4U 1.0, to make sure that RPM reaches and maintains where it has to be. And then I begin my threading cycle. If you run your RPM too slow, you have a chance of running that tool without the proper surface footage could cause premature tool wear, horrible chip control, and the thread could come out not looking beautiful like jewelry. If you run your RPM too fast, trying to get a faster cycle time, you can get also poor tool life and we're more prone to chatter on the threads with a higher RPM when we're single point threading. So those are a few ways that I would dial in your programming method. 
And once again, before we get to the third section, check out the other videos on Practical Machinists on G92, G76, and look for a video for me in the future covering G90, G76 extensively and the pros and cons versus G92. Now let's move on to the last, but maybe the most important section, deburring. What is deburring? What on earth is deburring? Now, I took a couple pictures of a part that we're running right now. It's a half inch NPT thread, but maybe you can see the front of this part here is very sharp to the touch. It is very sharp. I ran my threader and I took it out before deburring. And this is what we have. Now, this is one that we went in and deburred. I want you to focus on the front part of the thread here. That nice chamfer. So we single point threaded it, and then we came down with a grooving tool, hit the hex, moved down a little bit right along the major, came out, chamfered down here. We cut off the burr. This one we did not, and you'll be able to see in the pictures the, the stark difference between a, a thread that's not deburred and a thread that is. Now this part of the section could correctly or directly correlate to section two, which is programming method. I didn't know how to blend them two together because they're two separate things. Your programming method will give you a good thread, a beautiful thread, but then you have to go back and deburr it. So they are kind of linked, but a little bit different in this way. You can make a good thread with burrs. Certain customers don't care. What I always say is if it takes you an extra three, four, five seconds on a machine to go kick that burr off, and then shoot that re-thread again on another spring pass, it, to me, it's more than worth it. I love, love making a good thread burr free. So once you run that G92 or G76 and cut the thread, it's a very fast motion with a sharp tool. It tends to leave a burr on the back of the thread and it tends to leave a burr on the front of the thread. What I like to do, if possible, if it's a part with a thread relief, I go back here with a grooving tool, kiss that back thread relief, cut that burr off the thread in the back. Come back to the front, cut that burr off the front. Now the key is you're gonna go back and run that identical G92 or G76 threading coat, but with only one pass or two passes maximum. You wanna make sure they're at the same X diameter of the last pass of your previous threading code. So you're gonna thread, it's gonna drop down a bunch of passes like you saw in another video. Thread, 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 thread. It's gonna be burrs all over. You're gonna take a grooving tool, cut them off the front, cut them off the back. Now that burr is cut off, but it might be in the thread again. Burrs do funny things, they bounce back and forth. You're gonna take that threading tool, you're gonna to re-thread another spring pass at the end. Now, on harder materials in the past, 13.8, 17.4, some 304 stainless, I had to thread, deburr, re-thread, re-deburr. That's not very common, and maybe it wasn't even necessary. But deburring is super important. Now, you can take a part like this with the burr as it comes off the machine and have your operator file it down or sand it or hit it on like a little 3M wheel or something like that. The way I like to do it because I'm inherently lazy and I like to pass that laziness on to as many people as possible, have the CNC do the work for you. And a lot of it is just copy and paste. Your G92 or you know another point of contention I've had recently, I do a lot of hand programming. When I'm at the control typing, I can just copy the threading cycle, bring it down under the deburr, paste it, doctor it up a little bit to do one to two threading codes. It's very simple, it's very easy, it won't affect your cycle time very much, but the thread will be beautiful, trust me. I wanna show that real quick, what a deburring pass looks like right here. That is what a thread deburring operation looks like. So now that we've covered the three sections, tooling selection, programming method, 
And last, but of course not least, thread deburring. That will make a beautiful thread. And I don't know if we exceeded the 10 to 12 minute time frame. If we did, maybe I broke my promise. I promised within 10 to 12 minute video to teach you how to make a perfect thread. Now I've been threading for a long time. What would the world be like without threads? I couldn't even imagine it. Making a beautiful thread means so much to me that when I'm on a machine and I make one that I can grab, hold the part, grab the thread, twist the part and I don't completely eviscerate my hand with cuts, that's been a successful day. I really, really do enjoy making a burr-free part and especially a burr-free thread that I can send off to my customer and put us one notch above our competitors, hopefully. Well, until they watch this video, then they'll be able to do what I do, put me out of business. Like I said before, check out the rest of Practical Machinist channel. Loaded, loaded with awesome content from a bus bunch of awesome creators. With a lot of people have covered threads. How do you make a thread? Do you like threads that are beautiful and burr free or do you wanna cut yourself as you do it? Did this help at all? Did you learn anything? We're here for the comments, the good, the bad, the ugly. Like, subscribe, share. Thank you again for watching. This has been Luke with Practical Machinist. Another episode of The Lathe Lab. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.